The uh, Apostle Paul said that he was going to remain on. He wasn't leaving. He wasn't going to heaven, but he was going to remain on here for the fruitful labor that God had called him to. And that's what we saw this morning, a fruitful labor, the character of God living in and through us by the fruit of his spirit. Paul's going to direct us on that mission of a fruitful life. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to invite you to stand with me, if you will, this morning. The scripture will be on the screen. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30 will be our text this morning. You follow along with me. Paul said, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Father, we pray today that we would know your joy in our life, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what we're experiencing, regardless of what comes across our path that we would be walking in a manner that honors and pleases you, that we would be living our lives according to the gospel truth that you have shed in our hearts, that the joy that comes from knowing Jesus Christ would be the light of our path as we journey here on earth. God, we're asking that as your people that our labor would be fruitful, that we would hear your voice today and that we would be challenged to walk with you so that we see the fruit of your spirit living within us, changing us, transforming us, making us more like Jesus Christ in every way. Send your spirit in a powerful way, God, to do the work of healing in our hearts and minds this morning that we need so that we could see you clearly and know your joy and peace in life's journey here on earth. Come in a powerful way today. Be our teacher, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, be seated this morning, if you will. Paul uh, mentioned that he would be staying on. He wouldn't be leaving and going to heaven, but that he would be doing a fruitful labor here on earth. And he describes that fruitful labor as the worthy life, the life that is worthy of living. That is the fruitful labor that he is talking about. If you were with us last week, that joy of life comes from putting Jesus first, others, and then yourself. Paul made the hard choices in his life, particularly the hardest of all choices, that says, I'm going to put the needs of others before the wants and desires of my own life. And that's where the joy of Jesus really gets real in life. When we make those hard choices, we called it joy's dilemma last week. Those hard choices that we have to make every day of our life that will bring about the joy that Jesus has promised to us. Paul came to the point in his life where he desired to go to heaven, but said, I'm remaining here for your sake that he was going to lay aside the desires of his own heart so that he could help meet the needs of others. That is the fruitful labor that Paul is talking about. It is the worthy life that God has called us to as followers of Jesus Christ. And he describes it this way in verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. Paul, as he's in prison, as he's writing, he says, I'm hoping to come to you again, but whether I come or remain absent, this is what I want to hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit that you are together and united in Jesus Christ, that there is no separation from him and us. 
in one another, that together as the body of Christ, we are unified in spirit in Jesus Christ. And the way that happens is through the fruitful labor. It happens by only conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. What does that mean? If you want to have a fruitful life, if you want to have a life filled with joy, it comes from walking in a manner, conducting yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Kind of an interesting phrase here, worthy of the gospel. The word worthy in the Greek is axios. It's where we get the word axis. It's what the world is spinning on today. There's a a central point. Uh, in which something turns. If we were to bring a globe in here today, you would, you would be able to physically see that. If you were going to spin the world around, you would see the axis on which it sends, of which it, it turns. Maybe even another picture is if you were on the playground and you saw the teeter-totter, the fulcrum in the middle, it's that, it's that point of change. That's what, the, what Paul is talking about here when he talks about worthies. He's, he's talking about this access point. In fact, we just came from that point. You remember we were showing you last week the scales. Paul was walking us through that hard choice of whether he was going to live or die. That if he was going to die, it would be his gain. It would be his profit. It would mean that he would have to depart and be with Christ. And that would be better. That was his heart's desire. He didn't just say be better. He said it would be much better. Not just much better, but very much better better and the scales were tipping that was his desire and living would have meant would have meant being with Christ remaining here fruitful labor and we talked about that's the hard work of ministry and Paul as he was weighing that out it just totally tipped the other way when it came to the needs of others he said I'm going to have to remain here for your sake and so you can know the joy in your heart that I know in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's talking about here, this picture of scales. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. But he's using that picture in a different way this morning. What he's saying is that if you're a Christian, then your life should match up with your Christian conduct. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then your behavior should reflect that, that it should be in balance with who you are, that if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, that you would have an attitude of Jesus Christ. This picture of conduct is about every bit of who we are. It's uh, what we say, what we do, how we behave, what my attitude is. That if we claim to be a Christian, that we should walk in a manner worthy, that it should balance out. That on this access, when we say we're a Christian, we should look like a Christian. That's the fruitful labor that Paul is talking about. That that will balance out in our life. Walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he uses that word conduct because it's kind of an overall word here. It's interesting. In the Greek, we get the word in the English uh, politics or political. And I thought to myself, wow, that's an interesting choice of words, isn't it? Why would Paul use something that so tends to divide the church today? Politics. It's an interesting idea, this idea of conducting yourselves. Um, what Paul is saying, if you remember back as we, as we start to look at the book, uh, this letter that Paul writes to the Philippian people, you remember Philippi had become this Roman colony that uh, after the war between the Romans and the Greeks and Rome won, Philippi became this Roman colony. And you remember the people there, they were proud to be Roman citizens. They were, they were citizens of Rome. They had all the rights and privileges, and they were excited about that. Uh, many times we might think of it for ourselves. I'm excited to be an American. I'm grateful for the place that God has called me to live. And the people of Philippi were grateful that they were a part of this great Roman empire, that they were a Roman colony, that they had the rights and privileges of Rome, even though they were far, far, far away from Rome. 
And Paul uses this word specifically because what he's trying to convey to the believers there in Philippi was this. That you know how you have your love for being a Roman citizen? More importantly, you are a citizen of heaven. And so conduct yourselves only in a matter that is consistent with your citizenship in heaven. That should balance out. If you say you're a Christian, you should live like a Christian. If you say that you're a follower of Jesus, you should live like a follower of Jesus. That should be the principle that guides your life and your behavior and your attitude. And that was so important that he almost gave that principle in political terms. That they understood they, that regardless of how they saw their earthly life, that what, what was the goal and the overriding principle in their life is that they were citizens of heaven. Nothing divides the church more today than politics. Would you agree with me about that? But what if the church were all a part of the same party? That is the Jesus party that Paul is talking about. That what guides the principles of our life, our behavior, our attitude, our actions, is the reality that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and we are to be united in him. Everything else is second place. What we believe is that as citizens of heaven, that is what determines our decision making here on earth. That is who we belong to. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Make sure it balances out in your life. So whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, united in Christ. Paul is going to continue this idea into the next chapter. He is saying, this is the heart of fruitful labor. If the ministry is going to go forth and people are going to be changed and transformation is going to take change in the lives of people, if our world is going to be changed one person at a time, the church of Jesus Christ must be united in Christ. One spirit. Not two spirits, not bickering, not division, not disunification, but united in Jesus Christ. We can't let anything else divide us. We belong to one party, the Jesus party. Amen? Amen. We belong to Jesus. And he determines our behavior. He determines our thinking. He determines our actions. He determines how we make choices in life. Walk in a manner worthy of of the gospel in which you've been called. Only conduct yourselves in this manner, Paul says. And I like the the phrase only there. Only conduct yourselves this way, Paul says to the Philippians. In the Greek, it's really a statement of constraint. Uh, Literally, really more accurately interpreted, uh, interpreted would be merely conduct yourselves. Only conduct yourselves. It remind me of a time when I was a young kid. Maybe this was true for your, your, uh, for you. Your parents were leaving the house, and they gave you, gave you some instructions before they left. Mine went something like this: Here's what I need you to do while I'm out. I only need you to get the yards mowed and clean up your room while I'm gone. If you have a little extra time, get on your homework, right? And then after that, you can do whatever you want. And in my mind, and probably your mind, you're thinking, there ain't any other time after I do all that stuff. <laughs> you may have said only, but, but the reality is, is that only is going to take all of my time. And that's exactly what Paul was saying. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. That's what you have time for here on earth. You don't have time for anything else. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Often we find ourselves in that pinch, don't we, with time. I don't have time for that. I'm too busy for that. I've got other things to do. And what Paul was saying to the Philippians is, this is your one thing. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. That is what you are to do. 
Whatever you're doing, let your behavior and your attitude and what you look like reflect the character of Jesus Christ in your life. If you're on vacation, act like Jesus. If you're at work, act like Jesus. If you're at school, act like Jesus. If you're at home, act like Jesus. If you're in the neighborhood, act like Jesus. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Paul's going to go on to tell the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, in which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, the scripture says, the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God. We have a citizenship that is greater than any citizenship we know here on earth. That is our first priority. As Paul is talking about all of his struggles, as he's talking about joy in life, you can never have that here on earth if, you're, if you don't recognize that your citizenship is in heaven. If you're trying to find joy here, you'll never find it. And Paul is reminding them that if we're going to have fruitful labor in this ministry, in this moment, in this time, you have to stand firm in one spirit. You have to be completely united and what is the enemy constantly trying to do to the church? Divide it at every level. We see it in our world everywhere we look. God says to us, stay united. Be united in Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do, do your work heartily as unto the Lord rather than to men. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, as Paul was writing the church at Corinth, whether you eat or drink, they were arguing about meat sacrificed to idols. Should we eat it? Should we not eat it? Should we drink? Should we not drink? Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. If you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, act like it. Behave like it. Talk like it. Have an attitude like it, is what Paul is saying. It's in conducting ourselves this way. Paul says, whether I come and see you or whether I remain absent, I want to hear that you're standing firm in one spirit, totally united, living the worthy life, doing the fruitful labor that God has called us to. Paul is asking the Philippians to to look at life in a whole new way. You remember he started in verse 12. He said, I know you're looking at me in prison and you might be discouraged about that, but I want you to know that my situation has turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Don't be discouraged. As people are making fun of me in prison, don't be discouraged. Look at it in a totally different way. Verse 20, he said, I'm not going to be put to shame in anything, but with all boldness, Christ, even now as always, will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Whether I live or die, don't worry. God is going to be lifted up in my life. He's saying you got to think a whole different way. you got to look at the world a whole different way. And the way to do that is know that you are a citizen of heaven and only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of of the gospel. That is the fruitful life. You want to see the Spirit of God move? Stand united in Jesus Christ, living a life that is totally worthy of the gospel, and watch the Spirit of God move. And that's why often the Spirit of God, we're not seeing moving because the church is living like the culture in which the world we live in, and we're divided on every single issue. Paul is saying we ain't got time for that. Jesus Christ is the one that we follow. Him alone only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Stand firm in one spirit. Paul's going to tell them how to do that, how to stand firm in one spirit, how to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. But I think it's important before we hit that text that I tell you why it's important. Paul's going to talk about that later, but I want to just specifically tell you why that's important real quickly. As Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, you know that was a church that was divided at every level, had all kinds of struggles. And as Paul opens his letter to them, he says this in verses 10 and following, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete, whole, in the same mind and in the same judgment. You're all in the same party. For I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there's quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Is there more than one Christ? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? One of the reasons that Paul is writing the Philippian church is that there's, there's some disunity going on. And here he's addressing it at the very start of the letter, saying, you're not going to be effective in the ministry. You're not going to live the fruitful life if you don't live the worthy life, if you're not united in purpose. In Jesus Christ is what he's saying. Because the way the enemy works in this life is he divides and conquers. The Bible describes him as a roaring lion. He's prowling about, seeking someone that he might devour. And you know how he does that? He divides and conquers. He, he looks at a body like this and he says, okay, where's the disgruntled? Where's the one that's unhappy? Where's the one that's not joyful? Where's the one that's not getting along with somebody? Where's the one that has this opinion that's driving people apart? And he picks them off one by one and destroys them. I remember watching a documentary. I love to watch those animal documentaries on the open plain in Africa. There was a lion who was on the prowl, seeking to devour. And I remember the announcer talking about this, this big herd of zebras. I don't know, is it called a herd? This big herd of zebras. And he began explaining how they always stick together. Lots of times when you watch those documentaries, you always see the lion getting the gazelle, don't you? Or the, the wildebeest, who aren't quite as fast, but they can even track down the gazelles. But very rarely do you see them get a zebra. It happens, but very rarely. They look for the weak one. And he was talking about this pack of, of zebras, and basically all those stripes, when they're blended together in a herd, it just looks like one huge animal. And the only way that a lion could ever pick off a zebra is if it got by itself. And it looks for the weak one, the lame one, the young one, that he can, he can pull away from the pack. Otherwise, it just looks like this huge, this just one huge animal because of all those stripes. The body of Christ in these last days has to be together and united in Jesus Christ. We cannot be divided if we're going to be effective in ministry. And the only way that we can stand united in Christ is to be a part of one party, the party of Jesus Christ. That his values, his thinking, his attitude, his behavior is at the forefront of our heart. That we are citizens of heaven. When Paul showed up to found the church at Philippi, you remember he was, uh, he was beaten and, and, and mocked and brought before people. And it, in Acts chapter 16, verses 20 and 21, it said this about Paul and Silas. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or deserve, being Romans. Hey, this, this, this Christian stuff doesn't fit with our Roman heritage. And that's often what happens in, in the church is that we have our, our own philosophy, our own ideas. And Paul is saying to the church, if you want to make it, if you want to have fruitful labor, if you want to make a difference in the gospel ministry, we have to think and act like Jesus Christ only conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And when he writes to the church at Corinth, they are completely divided. And in verse 17 of chapter 1, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void, empty. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You want to know the quickest way to 
squelch or quench the spirit of God, be a church that is divided. Be a people who have their own idea and their own philosophy about the gospel rather than Jesus himself. And Paul is driving this point home because as they're looking at their circumstances and situation, they're going to be tested and tempted as to whether they could really live that out in their faith. And he's calling them to stand firm. Verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 6, Therefore take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Having done everything to stand firm. If you're going to stand firm and be united in one spirit and be unified, we have to recognize that there is a spiritual battle of an enemy who is trying to divide God's people, and God's people will not allow it to happen. Are you with me on that? That's what Paul is saying. Because he's asking them to live a worthy life, a fruitful life, a balanced life. To stand firm, right? You know something about sports. Whatever sport you're playing, you put on shoes that usually have some kind of cleats on them if you're outside, right? So that you could dig in and stand firm. We're going to be challenged at every level in the world, from inside and out. And if we want to have fruitful labor, that's why Paul was staying He knew the hard work of fruitful labor. You're going to have to be united in Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody divide you is what Paul is saying. And then he tells us how. He says this in the end of verse 27 and then into verse 28. We're going to stand firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel in no way alarmed by your opponents which is a sign of destruction for them but of salvation For you, and that too, from God. Paul says, first thing you need to do is understand this. As the body of Christ, united in Christ, we are of one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We do it with one mind. We think like Jesus. We have the mind of Christ We are growing in our faith so that as we look at our world and we see the chaos, that we are thinking about that the way Jesus thinks about it. Not the way our neighbor thinks about it. Maybe not even the way our family thinks about it. Certainly not the way our political parties think about it. But we think about what we see happening in the world one way with one mind the way Jesus Christ does which means that we have to be growing in our faith, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If we want to stay united, we have to think like Jesus. We have to be of one mind, striving together. The picture of striving here is the picture of the athlete who is lunging forward, who is pressing forward, who is moving ahead, who is not stagnant, who is not staying the same but is moving forward, pressing on, moving ahead, doing it together, not leaving anybody behind, moving as one body, one people, one spirit, he says. We do it together, unified, bringing along one another. And the only way that happens, as Paul said it to the Colossian church, was set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Recognize that you are citizens of heaven, enrolled in the kingdom of heaven, living out the principles that God has called us to. This is a whole new way of looking at the world. Paul is in prison. He is in distress. He is writing to his beloved Philippians. They've got to be thinking, this doesn't look good. And he's saying, if you want to have fruitful labor, you got to have this new perspective. you got to live, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Live in balance with who you are, who God made you to be. And do it together. That is your source of joy. That's why Paul could say, hey, this is all right. Regardless of my circumstance or situation, there is joy here. God is doing his thing. Verse 28, the opposite here. In no way alarmed by your opponents. I want you to strive together with one mind, striving together. And on the other hand, don't be alarmed by your opponents. Let me say that again. 
Don't be alarmed by your opponents. I got a new phone. Or, well, I didn't get a new phone. I had to get a, a replacement phone. My phone wasn't charging. And when I did that replacement, you know how that works. All your contacts and everything gets changed. All your settings get changed. I had my phone set perfectly so that on Sunday morning when I get up early for church, it kind of starts with a slow tone and then it gets a little louder and gets a lot. Well, I didn't know that it got changed back to its original. So last Sunday, my alarm went off at full blast and I about jumped out of bed when it went off. I was alarmed. <laughs> Paul says when it comes to looking at the opponents of Jesus Christ in the world, don't be alarmed. In the Greek, don't be frightened. When my alarm went off, I got frightened. It scared me. When you see what's happening in the world today, do not be alarmed. Do not be afraid. God is still in control. He says, do not be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them. If you want to defeat the enemy's wiles and attacks and his schemes, let him look at a church that is strong and united, not divided and weak. Let the world see that the people of God believe and trust what God has told them. In no way alarmed by the opponents of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says. This is a sign of destruction for them. When they see the church united continuing its work, keeping the main thing the main thing, sharing the gospel, conducting themselves only in a manner worthy of the gospel, balancing out who they are with how they live, when the world sees that, when the opponents of Jesus Christ sees that, it is destruction for them. It's a sign of destruction. It is a sign in destruction in the Greek of total loss. They are completely defeated when they see the church strong and united. And that's exactly why Paul said, don't be alarmed. Jesus told us how it was going to be. Don't worry about it. He said that's a sign of destruction for them, but here's how you should look at it. But of salvation for you. That as we see all that's happening, it should confirm for us what Jesus said, and he's going to save us. We don't have to worry about that. And that, too, from God. Just as God is using the difficult situations in the world, using the, the best situation in the world, God is doing his thing. And when the church trusts him, uh, that is a sign of destruction for them and a sign of salvation for us. That's what Paul is saying. You can live in joy. You can look at the world's circumstances and not be discouraged. He's trying to convince the Philippians because they see him in prison. They see him in distress. And he's saying, don't look at all this and get worked up about it. Everything is A-OK. -okay. In fact, it's even working out better than I thought. What if we could think like that? We'd be filled with joy. And Jesus would be using us to change the world one person at a time. That's what he's talking about. Stand firm in one spirit. Do it this way, by being together with one mind, striving forward for the gospel. No fear, a sign of destruction for the enemy. And it's important that we decide that today because here's why. Because when you make decisions in life, and after you make a decision, things start to go south, we start to second guess ourselves, don't we? We start to go, well, maybe, maybe I made the wrong decision there. And there's time for, for fruitful and wise discernment. But hopefully you did that before you made the decision. And if you have made that wise and fruitful discernment before, you can be confident that whatever circumstances happen, Jesus is still with you. There might be some rough patches, but you made the hard choices. That's Joy's dilemma. 
but you can move forward and know that God's going to bring you through because you prayed about it, you walked with God, you talked with God, you made the choice, and so some tough times came. And you should know that today, that when you decide to follow Jesus Christ, there's no second guessing. We stay united in Jesus Christ. We don't let him divide us. We don't let the enemy divide us so that he can pick us off one by one. We stay committed to the call that God has put on our life. And Paul is over and over again trying to convince the Philippians. And remember, in chapter 9, he said, I know this will turn out for my deliverance, my salvation through your prayers and through the provision of Jesus Christ. In verse 20, I'll not be put to shame in anything, but with all boldness as always, even now, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. In verse 12, I want you to know that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. But verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die it's just my profit it's my gain Paul is saying that in every circumstance and situation you got to think this way my beloved Philippians don't look at the world and become alarmed (laughs) keep your eyes on Jesus Christ only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel don't let your circumstances or your situations change your attitude Don't let it change your behavior to act like the world. I hear people all the time say today, oh, I got to do it that way. I got to cheat to get ahead. I got to do it the way they do. You're never going to get ahead that way. And God says, no, 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 no. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of God. God's got us covered. He's going to bring about the victory, he says. And so as he mentions that to him, he leaves him with this last thought in verse 29 and 30. He says, you're going to have to think of this sign of salvation in a whole different way. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Yikes. Experiencing the same conflicts which you saw in me and now here to be in me. You, you heard of my story, Paul said, when we started this church here in Philippi. You remember, you remember how they attacked us, Paul, uh, Paul and Silas, how they attacked us. You remember the struggle we had. You remember how we upset the apple cart, how that didn't go so well with a lot of people in Philippi. And now you're looking at me now, and you see me in prison, people causing me distress. And Paul says, I want you to look at all that as a sign of salvation for you, he says. I want you to look at it completely differently. Paul said, look at it the way Jesus looked at it. Paul wrote to to the churches and, and was giving them direction in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. He said, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In other words, all those who desire to only conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, only those who say they're a Christian and act like a Christian, they're the ones that are going to be persecuted. And Paul says when you see that happening, when you see the struggles of following Jesus, that should be a sign to you that you know Jesus Christ and you're following him. Wear it as a sign of of honor, a badge of honor that, that you could suffer for Jesus Christ because you belong to him. <laughs> you see, you got to look at this thing in a whole different way, he's saying. And that's why he used the word here, interesting, isn't it, in verse 29? For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake. Granted in the Greek is a word that's used... Um, to describe something positive, not something negative. I I think we would all consider suffering as not being a real positive. Paul uses the word granted to say, hey, this is a good thing. Let me tell you why. This has been granted to you. You're going to school and you want to get some money. You try to get a grant. You try to get something given to you. This word is often used when it's talked about our forgiveness in Jesus Christ. We've been granted forgiveness. We've been granted all these promises from Jesus, what he's done for us. And now he says it's been granted for you not just to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. He's trying to help him to see that this is your badge of honor. You belong to Jesus. 
You can have joy even when you're going through struggle and hard time. It's like um, someone inviting you over to your house. Say, hey, why don't you come on over? Uh, Hey, I'd love to have you. Get an invitation. But then you get invited to a wedding, and it's a whole different kind of invitation, isn't it? You get that formal invitation. It's formal. It's in the mail. It's delivered to your house, and it's written in that fancy calligraphy writing, and it's that formal language that says, you know, something like, we request the honor of your presence at the, the giving in this marriage of daughter, son, whoever it might be. It's this formal invitation, and that's what, what Paul is trying to say to the Philippians, is that, hey, God's not just saying, hey, we're on his team. God is saying, come, be a part, welcome, invitation. We are the same people. And keep walking united in that way, even in the midst of your struggling and suffering. I'd say this to you this morning, as long as we view the world through our own perspective, through our own political parties, through our own ideas, through our neighbors thinking, searching for joy and happiness and comfort and security and peace, we'll never accomplish what God desires for our life. We'll never know joy if we're listening to everybody else. Joy comes only from Jesus Christ. And Paul says, let me invite you, let me grant to you the joy of suffering found in Jesus. You saw it when we began the church. You see it now while I'm in prison. But don't let the enemy steal your joy. Because God is still running the show. Stay together. Keep striving together. Be of one mind. Don't ever let the enemy make you afraid or alarm you. That is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. Keep serving Jesus Christ. It is a spiritual war, isn't it? I love to watch that movie. I think it's called Troy. It's about that mythical war between the Romans and the Greeks. The reason I like it is it comes to the end of the movie after all of this battling taking place and Achilles who is fighting with his men finally tells him that he's got to finish the battle himself and he sends his warriors home. And as he sends them home, one stops Achilles and he says to him, fighting for you has been my life's honor, my lord. And I hear that in my head, and I want to be able to say to Jesus face to face, fighting for you, Jesus, has been my life's honor, my Lord. That why I walked here, fighting for you, has been my life's honor. I want that to be true about his church as we go through these struggling and challenging times in our world. That the weapons of our warfare, we don't fight with swords and knives We fight with the word of God and through prayer. The weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. That what God has provided to us will wipe out our opponents and our enemy. And he has called us to stand firm, to strive together, not to be alarmed. And you know what? When you have that perspective when you're conducting yourselves only in a manner worthy of the gospel, you can even have joy in the midst of suffering. That's hard to believe, isn't it? But story after story in human history where even when we saw Christian believers who were martyred in their faith, they died singing, praising God in complete joy. That is supernatural. That's the only way to explain that. But God promises that he will do it for you. Amen? Amen. Yeah, God, thank you today for your joy, for making our joy complete in Jesus Christ. And I'm praying, God, for us as your people, that in these days of struggle and challenge, that we would always, always be united in Christ Jesus. That our citizenship in heaven would be what motivates us, God, 
and drives us to walk with you each day. God, that we would be a people who are about the fruitful labor, the worthy walk of walking in a manner worthy of the gospel, striving together, never leaving one another behind, but with one mind, the mind of Christ, living out the purpose for which you have called us. Never alarmed, God. Never allow us to be afraid or to shrink back, but to stand firm, knowing that that's a sign of destruction for the enemy and of salvation for us. God, help us to be able to say in the end that fighting for you was our life's honor. That we would be a church standing firm on the good news of Jesus Christ and protecting and guarding the people of God, our brothers and sisters, united in one purpose. I want to just ask you this simple question with your head bowed and eyes closed this morning. Are you, are you ready? Are you willing? Are you able to stand for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to make that choice to say, I'm going to stand with Jesus Christ. I'm not going to shrink back. I'm not going to be fearful. I'm not going to let my, uh, the opponents of Jesus determine my future, but I'm going to stand with Jesus. It's important you make that decision today to say I am with you all the way. It has been my life's honor to fight for you. Can you make that choice in your heart this morning? And if you're here this morning and you don't know the joy of Jesus, maybe you're going through some of those struggles and you're looking for joy, you find it in Jesus Christ. And if you want some of that this morning, you could ask Jesus to take away your sin Invite him to be your Lord and Savior and know the joy of Jesus today. You can do that by simply saying in your heart, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin and wrongdoing, my rebellion against you. I'm inviting you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and make me whole and new. Bring me the joy of Jesus. Father, we love you today. Thank you for Jesus and what he means to us. Might we walk with him in a manner worthy of the gospel only now and forever. Amen.